Titanic, a 50,000 ton steel behemoth. For its day, it was a monument to engineering and science. To work its way up to full speed, giant engines thumped away for almost a full hour or so. And to stop at full speed, it would take literal miles. Maneuvering this kind of monstrous machine was a task in and of itself. And we've already looked at how the steering engines were used to turn this massive ship, but what good was steering if you didn't know where you were going? Since the days of sail, navigators had struggled to find their exact position, sometimes with dire, horrific consequences. It may surprise you to know that many of the techniques used on Titanic for navigation were extremely simple and had been in use for many hundreds of years already. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm your friend, Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs, and here is how they navigated the Titanic. The Titanic was designed to get across the Atlantic Ocean in a reliable, dependable way. See, it was a lot like getting a flight nowadays. You'd need to know your exact arrival day and times so that your friends could meet you, or you could organize taxis or pickups at the other end. Not only that, but many passengers had connecting trains or even other voyages on other ships to catch. Being delayed or even arriving early could be a massive hassle. Reliability was key. But herein lies a huge problem. Stretching between Titanic's departure point in Europe and its intended destination was some 5,500 kilometers or 3,400 miles of open ocean. And not just any ocean, this was the North Atlantic some of the globe's most fearsome waters. Believe it or not, for all of Titanic's size and splendor, it would still have to deal with the same issues that had plagued sailing ships from centuries before Titanic was even dreamt of. Back then, ships were at sea for weeks or months, with no sight of land, no satellite navigation to guide them. How could they be sure of where they were? A compass could point you in the right direction, hopefully, if it wasn't being thrown off by magnetic interference, and we'll get into that in a minute. But after weeks or months being tossed around in the ocean, how could you ever hope to know where you were? Or at least, where you were meant to be going? But Titanic had to overcome those same issues. It had to reliably arrive off Nantucket, within just a tiny margin of accuracy. Any further north, and the ship might run afoul of Massachusetts coastline. A bit further south, she might run straight into a remote stretch of New Jersey's coast. Fortunately for the crew and officers of Titanic by 1912, there were a few different techniques and technologies that helped in navigating the ship, and some were surprisingly basic. And steaming out of harbour, the first and most obvious thing to establish for your ship was the direction that you were actually heading in, and that required a compass. Back in the day, ships might have carried only one, but Titanic needed redundancies. In fact, the ship was all about inbuilt failsafes and backups. She didn't have one compass, she had four. The first two were mounted in the bridge and the inbuilt wheelhouse where the ship was steered from. A third was mounted way back on the docking bridge. This was essentially an emergency steering platform where the ship could be controlled, say, if the main bridge had been put out of action by a rogue wave. Obviously it would need its own compass, but there were problems with these. They relied on the Earth's natural magnetic field to point toward north, but because it was made of steel, Titanic had its own magnetic field. This meant the compass's needle might be thrown off, and even just one or two points of inaccuracy could be disastrous, sending the ship totally off in the wrong direction. To counter this, Titanic's bridge was actually made mostly of wood. In photos of the ship's construction, you can even see that the steel part of the ship's superstructure has been built, but a gap has been left for where they'd build the wooden bridge front later on. Despite this, the deck plates directly underneath were still made of metal, and inaccuracies could creep in. Obviously having three compasses was useful, they could be checked and compared against one another, and in extreme cases where all three were showing different readings, the average might be taken between them. But Titanic had a fourth compass, and this was arguably the most important. It was mounted high on a wooden platform between the ship's second and third funnel, and what was essentially the very centre of the ship. And being raised above the metal deck plates and exactly between the two funnels made this also the most neutral magnetic point on the ship. This compass was by its very nature the most accurate of the lot, and all the others could then have their readings compared against it. Knowing what direction they were sailing in was a good start, but how did Titanic's officers know where they were over the course of their five-day voyage? Inside of land, taking a bearing on landmarks and locations could give your ship's position on the map. The direction that another object might be from your ship is called a bearing. This was measured as a circle with a full 360 degrees. 
For example, a castle spotted on a shoreline off the starboard bow might be at a bearing of 010 degrees. When they weren't too far from the shoreline, a couple of landmarks could be spotted, and then taking different bearings from these could triangulate or yield your exact position on the chart. To calculate this with some degree of accuracy, Titanic's officers could use a Polaris. It's essentially a kind of compass without a needle. Outside of the bridge, on the wings, Titanic had two wooden pedestals. The Polaris itself was just a portable device in a box, and Titanic's crew could mount it in place to take their readings. Comparing readings against the ship's compass heading would yield accurate bearings and the ship's location. Once land had been left behind though, the Polaris was of little use for navigation, but it could still be used to get a bearing on any approaching ships or obstacles at sea. After a day or so into the voyage, there would be nothing around Titanic but open ocean, roaring waves, and an endless horizon. The system used for navigating accurately out there was complex and had been honed after centuries of experience at sea. It is honestly amazing, and it all started with the chronometer, a ship's clock that had to be as accurate as humanly possible. You might be wondering why a clock would be useful in determining where a ship is in the middle of the Atlantic. Well, this all stemmed from an ages-old question that seafarers had been dealing with since the days of sail. The world's maps were divided into a series of geographical coordinates, latitude and longitude. The latitude split the globe across its width, and the longitude from its top to its bottom. Comparing any latitude and longitude would give your exact location on the globe with great accuracy. But there was an issue. At sea, it was easier to determine your latitude, there were simple tables for that, but to determine their longitude, navigators had to compare the time aboard their ship with the time at the agreed zero point. For centuries, this was done by observing the sun, moon, and stars, a process called celestial observation. The relative positions in the sky at different times of year could give you an accurate longitude. But if there was no moon, sun, and stars, say in a storm that might last for days, you couldn't take a reading. This had been the cause of death for many ships. In 1845, the immigrant sailing ship Cataraki had been driven directly into jagged rocks off the Australian coast after days spent lost in a storm when the captain and crew couldn't take any celestial readings. 400 died, and only nine survived the wreck. By the late 1800s, though, mechanical clocks had got to a very advanced state of accuracy. Ships were fitted with advanced chronometers in heavily reinforced cases protected from any humidity or temperature changes that might impact the workings inside. Titanic carried two chronometers. The second was, of course, a redundancy. Of course, the two could be compared against one another to see how accurate they were, and as with the compasses, if there was any discrepancy, an average between the two might be used. The ship's chronometers were treated as a sacred item. In port, they were sent to specialist opticians to ensure their accuracy and calibration. At sea, they were religiously wound every 24 hours, even though, with their spring-driven power reserve, they could run for five days. Thanks to the chronometers aboard ship, Titanic could time the crew's celestial observations and the amount of time the ship had been at sea with enormous precision. Combining this data with the latitude would give Titanic's position on the globe with a great degree of accuracy. Of course, another relatively simple way of plotting Titanic's position at sea revolved around the sun, the moon, and the stars. Celestial observations were an ages-old way of figuring out where you were. As always, by comparing three or more celestial bodies, you could triangulate your position. This wasn't much good at daytime, though, because only the sun would be visible. A sextant could be used to take readings of the positions of stars at night and compare them against one another and use the different data points to triangulate a position on the chart. You'd take a reading of two or three stars for latitude and two or three for longitude and then use that to find your position. On the night of the sinking, Officer Joseph Boxall quickly took a reading of the stars to work out where Titanic was to call for help. But unfortunately, he may have taken his reading a bit too quickly he made a slight error, which translated to a difference of some 13 miles or 21 kilometers west of the actual sinking location. But as it happened, this was accurate enough that an approaching ship would be able to spot Titanic's masthead light. When the rescue ship Carpathia arrived on scene, her captain Arthur Rostron congratulated Boxall on his accurate coordinates. With the officers confident they knew where they were at sea, another navigational requirement arose, the need to track progress over the course of the voyage. This was a constant source of conversation among passengers and even a subject of gambling. 
The daily run was posted every morning and showed how many miles the Titanic had covered the previous day. This could be done from taking measurements on the chart, but Titanic was also fitted with another curious device to measure its speed. The patent log was a simple enough machine designed to measure Titanic's speed through the water and the amount of distance it had covered. It was mounted at the very stern of the ship and essentially comprised a simple rotator, which was similar to a ship's propeller. It was cast over the side and attached to a box with a long cord. It was towed behind Titanic and would rotate through the water at different speeds depending on how fast the ship was going. A series of gears drove dials which registered how far had been travelled in miles according to the rotator in the water. A register up on the docking bridge at the stern of the ship showed the readings. While Titanic was at sea, it was always towing the log behind it, and the readings were checked every two hours by a quartermaster on duty. With the voyage coming to an end, Titanic would be again close to shore, so extra navigational care would need to be taken. Thanks to the accurate navigation readings that had been taken at sea, the ship would arrive off Nantucket Island with no trouble. Land could be sighted and the sextant used to calculate the distance from land and a course plotted to take Titanic up the Hudson and into New York. But if it was foggy, there might be serious problems. Fog at sea, especially off Nantucket, can be a killer. It was responsible for the sinking of Andrea Doria in 1956 when she was rammed by the line of Stockholm in a thick mist. In Titanic's day, ships didn't just have to deal with each other. In a dense bank of fog, an unwitting captain might run his ship directly into the shore without ever sighting land. Boys were positioned around, as well as foghorn stations which could blast a warning out over the waves. But the crew of Titanic might be confused. The fog could distort the sound and make it sound like it was coming from multiple directions. For this, the Titanic was fitted with what is probably its most unusual and little known feature, a submarine signaller. If the ship was caught out in a fog bank, it might rely on special boys that were designed in the 1800s to help out. These had underwater bells. Sound travels much, much further underwater than it does through the air. On either side of Titanic's hull, forward at about the cargo hold, was fitted a signaller, essentially a big microphone built into a tank in the ship's side below the waterline that was designed to detect the sound of those bells. Titanic could hear those bells up to 15 miles or 24 kilometres away. The signallers were connected to a headset on the bridge with a simple telephone cable. Just like a telephone, an officer could pick up the headset and tune in to either the left or the right signaller. Its function was really simple. If you could hear the bells from the left signaller, it meant that there was danger off to the ship's left. If you could hear the right signaller, it meant the same thing for the starboard side. And if you could hear the bells in both signallers, it meant that danger was right ahead. Finally, as Titanic approached the end of her voyage, she might be entering some tricky waterways. Travelling into harbours, the ship would need to stick closely to deep channels, or else she could get beached and stuck in shallow water. To do this, the ship needed a machine designed to register the depth below the ship's keel and ensure that there was always enough of a gap to prevent disaster. Back in the old days of sail, a sailor would literally throw a lead weight on a rope over the side of the ship and figure the depth from how far the line ran before the weight hit the bottom. Titanic took this simple concept and scaled it up. On either side of the ship's bridge was fitted a 30 foot long pole called a sounding spar which could be swung out over the side of the ship. Then, a heavy metal sinker attached to a cable could be dropped overboard. Readings could be taken with the help of a device called the Lord Kelvin's Motorised Sounding Machine, which was kept on the boat deck just behind the bridge in a watertight case. The cable could run for 600 feet or 182 metres and attached to the end, as well as the sinker, was a cylinder, which used differences in air pressure to take a depth sounding and record the result. There was a backup for this too. I told you, Titanic, like all ships, was designed with redundancies in mind. Absolutely everything had a backup. On a deck at either side of the ship was a small platform that could be dropped and secured in place. Just like on the sailing ships of old, a sailor could cast a weighted line himself over the side of the ship and count out how far the cable ran, and how deep the water was. Setting up and using the sounding machine took time, but if the ship's captain had to feel his way through unfamiliar waters, a sailor out on the leadsman's platform could take regular soundings of depth to give accurate, frequent reports. When they weren't in use, the platforms were folded up and locked to the side of the ship. You can see them appear in photos as a small dark square on the ship's white superstructure. In future years, ships would gain new and innovative ways of navigating with certainty, from wireless radio triangulation and direction finding to radar and, finally, 
real-time GPS, and satellite data. It seems amazing that a ship as relatively modern as Titanic mostly relied on those ages-old means of navigation, reading the stars and sky and keeping track of time. Of course, due to her short service life, Titanic barely got to use many of the devices and techniques we talked about today. Back then, with no radar, navigational hazards mid-ocean were rare, but very dangerous. Icebergs were well known and much feared by sea captains, but there was simply no way of detecting them ahead of time. You could only post more lookouts, men with keenly trained eyes to look ahead in the dark and hope that they'd see ice in time to stop or turn. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Oceanliner Designs. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel because we get new videos out weekly. If you want to support my work and get really cool perks like behind the scenes and early access, please visit my Patreon in the link in the description below or sign up as a YouTube member. Come and join the crew. And as always, stay safe, stay happy, and I'll see you again next time.